Okay, hello everybody, and welcome to the third, maybe fourth, I can't remember now, uh, Sizzle Virtual Seminar. Um, and uh, I'm glad you could join us today. First seminar of the new administration. Our speaker today is Kevin Bruweiler, who will be speaking on Aperture, a system for interactive visualization of voluminous geospatial data. Uh, Kevin is a graduate research assistant at Colorado State University. He grew up in Boulder, Colorado and received a master's in computer science in 2020 for work in the fields of distributed systems, big data and geospatial data visualization. My understanding is the talk we're gonna hear is actually related to his master's work specifically. Uh, he is planning to pursue a PhD in computer science at the University of Southern California. So please welcome Kevin Brewweiler. Thank you very much. Um, that was a great introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about this um, system that was part of my master's work called Aperture. Um, it's for remote uh, geospatial data visualization, which is to say it lets you uh, visualize large amounts of geospatial data that's not stored on your personal computer. It's stored somewhere else. And in our case, it's on a cluster of machines at Colorado State University. So the, the um, end product of what we're making is going to look a lot like this image on the right. Um, it's visualized, this is visualizing three different features from the NOAA North American mesoscale data set. Um, temperature, which is the colors, precipitable water, which is the purple, and then relative humidity, which is the white coloring. Um, and it can visualize more features. If you're interested in this work, because um, this is going to be kind of brief, most of this material is taken from these two papers um, on the bottom. Um, so if you want to, for whatever reason, you want to go into more detail, you can look these up. Um, but the motivation behind this work fundamentally is that data visualization is a key aspect of data analysis, um, most importantly on novel data sets, on, on brand new or relatively new data sets. Um, the, the helpful part of the visualization is that it helps you identify patterns that are difficult to spot in raw data. I mean, people are very, very visual creatures and looking at numbers in a spreadsheet is fundamentally very different than looking at them drawn, especially when those numbers relate to locations on on a map or on some other object. It's, it, the relationships between them are much more apparent when they're visualized. This is especially true for data covering very large scopes. Uh, for example, you're probably pretty familiar with traffic patterns on your way to work, or at least you used to be, uh, but you're probably not too familiar with traffic patterns across your entire city, and especially not too familiar with how those traffic patterns have changed over the last hundred years. Right? That, that becomes very difficult to very difficult information to glean from a spreadsheet or from any, any other just sort of raw storage of data. You really have to be able to see things on that large of a scale. A visualization also usually precedes more technical analyses. It provides a starting point. You, you, you identify patterns or features in this data that you're visualizing and it gives you questions or things to think about for the, for the future in ways like we, we really need to crunch the numbers on this and see whether this is actually meaningful or it's just a coincidence. It can also illustrate areas in which data is inconsistent or lacking. I have plenty of stories about cases like this where we put together a data set with this tool and we visualized it. We went, that's weird. There are literally no heat waves in Texas ever. I think there's something wrong with our analysis. Um, so this can be very helpful as well, just as a sanity check. There are some additional non-academic benefits of visualization as well. These being things like education and public outreach, um, especially for non uh, scientifically educated people, it can be important to illustrate things to them in a way that they can understand so that they, they trust you and take appropriate action. Uh, it's also useful for informing policy and decision making in, in private and public businesses, whether you're, you're talking to politicians or managers or whatever, it's important that you're able to persuade them based on data. And if they can't understand that data and it doesn't make sense to them, that can be a serious problem. So visualization is very useful in those cases. The challenges that we're facing if, with this large scale remote data visualization uh, is primarily based around data volumes. Uh, and the issue here is that visualizing every data point in a large data set is often infeasible. I mean, most, most HD video screens have around 2 million pixels, very large screens may have many more, but if you've more than 2 million data points, you, you physically cannot visualize every single one. And even if you could, it's hard for a user to make sense of individual pixels. Uh, without pressing their face to the screen, which is not an ideal solution. Uh, this also introduces engineering issues related to data storage and data access times, um, reading data off of persistent storage, um, whether that's hard disks or tapes or even, even flash memory can be very slow uh, and interactive visualization becomes 
very difficult uh, when you have to wait for minutes or hours just to read the data before you can even start any analysis. Uh, tangential to that is responsiveness. Um, there have been multiple studies that show that the user trust and perception of functionality of any system or data set is tied to how responsive it is and how interactive it is. So it's very important that these systems work well and quickly if they're very slow. Also from an academic perspective, if they're very slow, you're going to lose your train of thought. You know, if you have to wait an hour or two every time you want to look at a new portion of the data set, that's going to be a serious issue. Interactivity. And to effectively identify patterns, users have to be able to specify the scopes that they're interested in, these being spatial scopes, temporal scopes, you know, whatever features they want to look at, anything else that might be relevant, depending on what sort of data set it is. And they also need to be able to, to visualize relationships between features somehow, because the most interesting discoveries and the most interesting points are usually not based around a single feature, but based around interactions between things like temperature and humidity, right? Temperature alone can be interesting, but there's a lot more you can do if you can look at multiple things at the same time. And finally, fidelity, which is, which is pretty simple. It's a, a simple way of saying quality, basically. Whatever, whatever tools you're using to visualize the data set should not modify the data set or should modify it as little as possible, but they also need to make everything as clear as possible. So this is, this is relatively straightforward. Don't, don't damage the data while you're visualizing it. So existing approaches for remote data visualization tend to fall into two categories. The first are approaches which use all of the available data. Uh, these frequently require a computing cluster or maybe a supercomputer or just a very long time on a single computer to generate, generate these visualizations. Um, the algorithms based around these tend to focus on removing redundant information so that the user can make sense of all this data. Um, and the result of that is that they tend to be slow, but also very high quality. So if you're making, um, you know, you're, you're trying to make very precise images for a, a paper or something, this would be fine, right? You can create some beautiful high quality stuff with these algorithms. Um, the other alternative is approaches which sample the data set. Uh, these are often very fast and efficient. Uh, nearly everything that, um, nearly every remote data visualization application is going to use some sort of sampling method. Uh, and these scale well, which means that you can serve multiple users with these at once. I mean, uh, Google Maps, Google traffic and stuff like that definitely use these sorts of methods. Uh, there are some common issues with these sampling uh, data algorithms though. The first is that if you don't know what patterns you're looking for, how do you ensure that the sampling method is preserving them? For example, if you're sampling one data point from, you know, you're drawing a grid over the world and you're taking one point from each face in the grid, how do you know that there aren't, you know, a million points in one of those boxes and then you're missing a ton of data? Alternatively, if it, and well, I mean, on a similar note, really, if it's a new data set, how do you know enough about its distribution to effectively sample it, All right? In some cases, this is easy, but if you're working with a hundred different features and you don't necessarily know how those features interact with each other, it's very hard to come up with a, um, a sampling algorithm that's not going to discard something. And you have no idea if what you're discarding is important if this is brand new. Uh, so our approach is sort of a, I would call it a variation on a sampling algorithm where we use a form of um, statistical compression and then reconstruct the data. And I will get, I will definitely go over that in more detail soon. Um, but we use something called a data sketch um, we store it in a distributed hash table. If you're not familiar, it's a way of storing data across a cluster of computers so that you can very quickly uh, figure out where any one piece of data that you want is without having to you know, read all of the data on all of the computers. Uh, we generate queries from user interactions on a web page and we visualize data on the web page as well. You've already seen the output of that visualization. And then we have two different configurations. The first is server-side rastering, which is more of the um, sort of full data approach. Uh, where we're generating visualizations on the server side and then sending those to the client. And we also try client side rastering, which is more of a sampling method where we're streaming data directly to the client and the client is putting the visualization together as the data arrives. Uh, our system architecture is, is relatively straightforward. It's, it's very much a server client uh, setup. I hope you can see my mouse. The uh, web browser is the green this, the client is everything in the green box. Everything else is running on some sort of backend server. Uh, the server is broken up into two parts. We have a distributed hash table to store the data. Uh, we have an array of proxy nodes that, depending on the configuration, are either computing the visualization or just forwarding the data back to the client. Um, and then the client is, is using Leaflet, which is a sort of open source Google Maps alternative. So one, 
topic to cover briefly just to help understand sketches is geohashes. I don't know if, um, I don't know how many people are familiar with geohashes, but basically all they're doing is mapping a region of the globe to a bit string. And that bit string is usually represented as a, um, just a regular string with each four bits mapped to a character. Um, the way this works is that longer strings identify smaller regions. So you can see within the uh, region identified with the character G, uh, smaller regions are broken up. There's GP, GR, GX. Um, and this gives it a very nice hierarchical structure, which makes certain algorithms very efficient. Um, it, lets for fast, it allows for faster searches than latitude and longitude bounding boxes do. It allows for quick refinement. You could certainly implement everything we've done here with latitude and longitude bounding boxes or with some other uh, geo-indexing scheme if you wanted to. Geohashes are just very, very convenient and very appealing from an algorithmic perspective. Um, it simplifies queries and it simplifies the storage structure of the distributed hash table. The only downside is that it makes queries for arbitrary regions somewhat more difficult. Like if you wanted to query all of the data for North America, you'd be looking at 9 and D and half of C and half of F and um, I don't know, what, <laughs> it's not listing the character here, but you would, you know, you're querying like six or seven and a half geohashes and it gets a little bit awkward. So sketches, this is one of the more important parts of our setup. Um, sketches are a form of statistical data compression, which means that from this sketch, you can reconstruct the original data set, but it's, loss, it's not lossless, which means that there will be a certain error bound. So you can't get the precise data back from these sketches. You can just get an approximation of it. Um, this particular algorithm is called Synopsys. It was developed by another student in my research group at CSU. Um, it organized, its uh, sketch is organized as a forest of strands, and there's a single strand over on the right here. Uh, each strand has a spatial temporal scope, and in this case, the spatial component is a geohash, as we just talked about. Uh, the temporal component is a date range. Uh, here, it's a 15-minute range. I think for most of these visualizations, we use the six-hour range, but it depends on how small you want the sketch to be. Um, if at any point you want to reduce the size of the sketch, you just increase these ranges so that you're compressing more data within a single strand. Again, the downside of that is that you, it's less accurate when you reconstruct it um, in this case. And then you arrange however many features you want to minimize the strand size. I believe that means the feature with the highest variation for this spatial and temporal range goes at the top. Um, but the way this works is that in this particular strand, all of the data points that have a humidity that fall between this range, a precipitation that fall between this range, and a temperature that fall between this range will be stored in this single data container. And the data container maintains statistical information, things like the sum, the mean, the count, a covariance matrix, stuff like that. Everything you need to recompute an approximation of all of the data points that were put in there. Um, and when we perform queries on the system, we're performing queries over this sketch rather than over individual data points. And what, once we get these strands back from the queries, then we can estimate the original data and render that. Um, and this, this really reduces the size of the data. It, it reduces it anywhere between 100 and 1,000 times usually, again, configurable. Uh, and that has serious implications for how long it takes to retrieve the data, how much network bandwidth it takes to send the data to the client and stuff like that. Uh, when we're evaluating queries on the back end, again, these strands are all stored in a distributed hash table. Uh, and we, the, they're indexed by geohash. Um, and evenly distributed across all of the machines using cryptographic hashing, which means that effectively, if you're querying a large area, you're going to be touching a large number of machines evenly. You're not going to be sending that query just to one machine to do all the work. You're going to be trying to split it into as many parts and doing as many little bits on individual machines as possible. Uh, the server will also divide subqueries if the queries are very large um, so that some of the uh, bookkeeping stuff can be run in parallel along with the actual data retrieval. So we're trying to break queries up on the server side as much as possible. Now, in the case of server side rastering, all of this data is going to be returned to a single proxy node, which is going to compute a diagram around the points. And then once that diagram is turned into an image that the client can understand, it's sent back to the client to render. In the case of client side rastering, the proxy nodes don't do much. They just forward the data points directly back to the client, and the client is responsible for rendering them individually. Uh, and the, the upside of this method is that streaming guarantees fast response times. The, in the case of server-side rastering, the proxy node is waiting for all of the data points to arrive before it can render it. This is sort of a, a full data approach. 
Uh, whereas in the case of client side rastering, the data points are being sent back to the client as soon as they are retrieved, um, which from the client's perspective is very nice because it means as soon as you ask for a visualization, you will see it start getting constructed within a couple microseconds. It's very fast. So to talk about server side rastering in a little bit more detail. Again, the entire, the entire visualization is computed server side. The client does not do very much work in this case, which is one of the major pros of this server side rastering method. The visualization we construct is called a Voronoi diagram. It's basically just drawing polygons around every point by sort of cutting. It, it basically draws triangles out of all the points and cuts the triangles in half. The details aren't, aren't very important, but it is a, um, it's basically a way of making sure that we're approximating as little as possible. When we're creating this visualization, every pixel of the visualization is being colored based on the nearest data point. There's no, no approximations going on. Um, this is done efficiently using the Delaunay triangulation algorithm, just in case you wanted to implement this for yourself for whatever reason. Uh, users must wait for both query and rastering to complete before seeing the response, which is, can be a problem as we'll see in the, the sort of benchmark section. This can take a little while. Uh, especially at large scales, at small scales, it's very fast. Uh, we try to compensate for the slowness in this case using predictive caching in a few different ways. Uh, one of the ways we're doing this is computing future temporal scopes. Uh, this is a fancy way of saying if you're looking at the data for today, we're also going to render the data for tomorrow and the next day and the day after that under the assumption that there's a good chance you'll be wanting to sort of look at things linearly. So then when you ask for it, we don't have to pre-compute it, it's already there. Uh, we also look at adjacent spatial scopes. Um, so if you're looking at Boulder, for example, we'll be computing the visualization for Fort Collins and Denver as well, just in case you start panning around. Um, and we have an additional method that we experimented with where if the user starts panning in a certain direction, we will extrapolate the direction they're going and start um, sort of pre-computing visualizations out in a line under the assumption that they're going to keep panning that way. Um, and in these cases, we're just computing the visualization and storing it in the event that the user asks for it. And if they don't ask for it, it will eventually be dropped. So the pros of server-side rastering in this case are A, it produces very high quality visualizations. You realistically can't beat the quality of these. Uh, and you have multiple visualizations for a single user that be, can be computed simultaneously, which lets you pre-raster stuff that you can predict the user might want in the future. Um, and we also discussed using some machine learning methods to try and predict even more accurately. We ultimately didn't end up doing that, but it's certainly possible. Uh, the cons is that it can be very slow uh, and you have scalability issues because you're relying on the proxy nodes to compute all these visualizations. If you have more clients than you have proxy nodes, they're going to be competing with each other for resources, right? At some point, all of the proxy nodes are going to be busy and new clients are just going to have to wait essentially in a queue. Uh, which causes a problem if you have a very small cluster or a very large number of clients. Client-side rastering, on the other hand, is where data is streamed directly from the server to the client. The client receives data as fast as the server can read it, so the client perceives effectively an instant response, and it is the client that is responsible for rendering data points. The downside here is that client-side resources are generally much lower. Uh, you don't meet many people who have a personal computer that's more powerful than an entire computing cluster. Um, you also have potential situations where the client has a, a, an old laptop or a smartphone or a tablet, or they have a, a bad internet connection because they're working from home or they're in a rural area or any number of things might go wrong there that you can't control. And in those cases, maybe this application just won't work very well for them, uh, which can be a problem depending on who you're making this for. Uh, Again, the client can see response immediately, but they do have to wait for all of the data to arrive before the visualization is complete. They sort of see the visualization drawn in real time. And um, we have a, a, a visualization of that in a little while. Um, we can use a subset of the early data though to estimate what future data may look like, which we call decay. Um, this is something I'm gonna talk about a lot in a little bit. Hopefully it will become pretty intuitive, um, but this is essentially a, a cheap way of sort of speeding up the response time that the client perceives, even though it doesn't really make anything faster. Um, and then we replace those estimations. So the longer you wait, the more accurate the visualization becomes. Um, we also have, uh, we've also set this up so that the client can optionally make use of a GPU for creating these visualizations, which as you'll see is very beneficial. Uh, so while on the one hand, you have the possible risk that the people using this application have very poor quality hardware on their end, 
You also have the possibility that they have very nice hardware on their end, and then you can use that to take a lot of the computational load off of the server. So that really depends on who you think is going to be using this application. So the pros of client-side rastering are that the client gets a near instant response and offloading the computation to the client allows the server to handle many more clients than it would be able to if it were computing all the visualizations itself. The cons are that sending all the data to the client generates significantly more network traffic, both for the server and for the client, because uh, images are much smaller than raw data, obviously. Um, and approximating future data leads to a loss in fidelity in certain cases. Another thing we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. Uh, you, you have to make some approximations when you're doing things on the client side, and that can lead to some problems. The other downside is that the client can't raster multiple visualizations simultaneously, so you can't do any sort of predictive caching. Um, even if you were doing things in the back end, which we tried, it slows down the web page enough to be noticeable, um, which is a problem. So basically, you don't do any sort of predictive caching. You hope that the near instant response and the sort of incremental decay schemes are enough to placate the user uh, when they have to wait for more data. So our experimental setup for the benchmarks that we're going to be talking about, if you're curious, uh, we have a cluster of 75 machines. Uh, we refer to those as commodity machines. They're not particularly expensive. They're the sort of things you would expect to find in any sort of cloud computing environment. The only difference is they have extra, they have a few extra terabytes of storage. Uh, our proxy nodes are a little bit more powerful. They're varied from experiment to experiment. I don't think we ever had more than five. Um, the client we use to evaluate this um, is the laptop I'm currently presenting this on now. Um, it's got a you know, sort of middle of the road GPU, a decent amount of RAM. Uh, and these experiments were performed on the NAM forecasting system data set. Um, and based on our estimations, each six hour period we're visualizing is about 40 gigabytes. It, it seems to vary a lot. Um, but that is a, a reasonable middle of the road estimate. So the scalability of Synopsys of our backend server, um, if you're not familiar with these computer science terms, um, latency would be how long does the query take and throughput is how many queries can be handled within a certain time frame. Um, and in this case, we can see on the left side a fairly typical pattern from these querying systems where the throughput will rise linearly until it doesn't, eventually it will plateau. Whereas the query latency will usually stay flat until the throughput starts to reach a certain point at which point, at which case it will increase exponentially. Um, and the throughput increasing linearly is a good thing. This is basically, you know, here we're doubling the number of clients and the throughput is increasing at pace. So things aren't really slowing down. Uh, you will notice it does slow down a little bit because the X axis is logarithmic but that's more or less unavoidable because the um, backend servers are now sort of competing with each other to fetch data. Um, you can see based on this, we get up to about 80, you know, somewhere between 50 and 80 clients before it starts slowing down. Um, and it should be noted that these clients are constantly running queries. So in practice, this is about 80 simultaneous queries, not 80 people looking at the website at once. If users are only running queries once every second, this is probably closer to 800, once every 10 seconds, maybe more like 8,000 users. It, it gets hard to test multiple clients at a certain point, um, especially when you don't necessarily know what the client behavior is going to be or when clients might be using things in different ways. But regardless, this scales very well. And the latency in this case never exceeds more than 50 or 60 milliseconds, which is totally unnoticeable to um, the average user. We also look at the effects that the proxy array size has on getting data out of our system. Um, and we can see, this might be a little bit hard to interpret, but with only a single proxy node, the latency is very high. And we worked out that this is because of bandwidth problems. Um, that one machine didn't have enough bandwidth to send all of the data out. So by just adding a few more proxy nodes, you can see the latency sort of starts to plateau out. And at that point, we're being bottlenecked by something else, either the number of machines in the cluster. Uh, the main takeaway from this is that you don't need a very large number of these proxy machines if you don't want them. Um, adding more will fix your uh, bandwidth issue pretty quickly. Now the responsiveness from the server side rastering, um, and again you can look at the papers for a little bit more detail, we break up the server side rastering into five different phases. Um, the query phase is waiting for the DHT to fetch all of the data. If this were client-side rastering, the query phase is the only thing that's being done. Uh, 
In the case of server-side rastering, it's just the first part, because after all of that, we have to break the sketch apart into data, and then we have to compute the visualization, and then we have to turn the visualization into an image, and then we have to send the image to the client, and all of that, as you can see, eats up a lot of time. If you're looking at this whole data set, which you remember was most of Native America, uh, most of North America, uh, it takes a little over five seconds, and a lot of that is dominated by the amount of time it takes to draw the image, um, and the amount of time it takes to decode and compute the image it takes up, you know, four and a half out of five seconds. Network time is relatively constant because the image you're sending to the client doesn't really change size that much. Um, but you can see that for smaller areas, this is half a second, right? This is, if, if you're looking at a very small area, you can use server-side rastering to compute visualizations fast enough that the user is not really going to perceive any sort of delay. It's only at large scales where it starts to become a problem. Client-side rastering responsiveness is a little bit harder to measure um, because rather than just sending them one thing, we're sending them any any number of hundreds of thousands of little things. Um, so we measure this by using the number of strands that the client can receive and render per second, which is what's pictured here uh, with and without GPU support. Uh, the advantage of this sort of methodology is that it can be extrapolated to any sort of data size. And you can also use this to judge how, um, how small you want your sketch to be. So if you're not too worried about the error bound or you wanna balance out the error bound and the rendering time, you can use this information to make an informed decision. Um, with a GPU, the client can render approximately 50,000 strands per second. Uh, with a CPU, it's closer to 10,000, but it's very inconsistent. Uh, and this is because the CPU is required to receive and deserialize strands as well as refresh your screen and do other stuff like that. Um, basically, the CPU is multitasking, whereas when you have a GPU, your CPU is receiving strands and deserializing them and all the GPU is responsible for is rendering them. And you can see in this case, it's basically working as fast as it can. I think in this case, it's probably still the CPU bottlenecking things. Um, either that or data isn't arriving fast enough. Um, so you get a lot more consistent results if you're using a GPU. But you can see here, um, with a GPU, it takes about the same amount of time, um, a little over five seconds, to render all of the data points. Uh, so if you, if you want to visualize the complete data set. It doesn't really matter time-wise, whether you're using client-side or server-side. Uh, you just have slightly different effects depending on whether you're using the predictive caching or whether you're using the decay schemes. And we'll see more of that in a minute. So rastering fidelity, to finally talk about these decay schemes. Uh, the way this works is that early data points are given more weight than later data points, which essentially means that we're drawing them larger. Um, and then as we receive more data points, they're going to be drawn smaller, but drawn over the larger points. Effectively, what this does is that it uses early data points in place of data that hasn't arrived yet. So if you're looking at temperature and you get the temperature data for Fort Collins for a specific time, for example, we will draw that not over just uh, Fort Collins, but over Boulder, maybe part of Wyoming, maybe Denver as well. And then when we get data points for Boulder and Denver, we're going to draw those smaller where they should be. Uh, and the assumption there is that the temperature in Fort Collins is going to be basically the same as in Boulder and Denver. Maybe not identically, but close enough that the approximation will be acceptable while the user waits. Um, we experiment with both linear and exponential decay, which just controls how rapidly the new data points decrease in size. And you'll see the effect of both of those in a moment. Uh, the trouble with this methodology is that it fails near the edges of the data set um, because you're approximating data that doesn't exist. So if we just had data for Colorado and you draw part of that um, data point over Fort Collins and uh, part of that goes over Wyoming, you're never going to get the actual data for Wyoming because it doesn't exist and the client doesn't know that it doesn't exist when it's drawing the early data points. So you will have approximations of, of, of data that's just not there. And that's largely unavoidable um, unless you know exa the exact bounds of the data that you're trying to visualize. So the visualization of these decay schemes. These columns, the first column is a tenth of a second after the query was initiated. The second is three quarters of a second. And the third is four seconds when basically all of the data points have arrived. Uh, you can see if you're not using any decay scheme, the data points in this case are very small. Uh, depending on your screen, you might not even be able to see them here or it might just look like your screen is a little bit dirty. Uh, but you can see by three quarters of the way in, we're starting to fill out um, this region with the data that's coming in. It's still more empty space than data, but you can at least sort of see the outlines of stuff. 
Um, and then by four seconds, it's filled in and it's generally looks relatively high quality. Uh, linear decay is where we're drawing new data points at a fixed size. And then each uh, for each data point that arrives, we reduce the size we're drawing it by a fixed size. And so for these early like 100 points, they're all basically going to be drawn at the same size. And you can sort of see how it's approximating the final product, right? It's got the, it's got the temperatures right in basically all of the right places. The issue with the linear decay is that, you know, one second in, it creates these very jagged edges because the size doesn't decrease very rapidly. Um, so you get these kind of weird artifacts um, along boundaries where the color is changed. But uh, four seconds in, it's, it's relatively high quality. Exponential decay starts out by drawing things very large, which is why a tenth of a second in, it's already basically filled out the entire area. Uh, but then the size rapidly decreases, which helps get rid of those artifacts at the midway point. So you can see the, I mean, you, you probably can't spot any realistic difference between three quarters of a second and four seconds in, right? From the user's perspective, the visualization is done in less than a second using exponential decay. And if you compare it to the actual visualization, it's pretty close. The places where you get problems, for example, if you look at this northern bit of Canada here, in both the linear decay and the exponential decay, you end up covering up part of that region. And this is the problem where we're using data points to approximate it. You can even see here, one of the early data points has arrived in both of these cases, and it's approximating data for this land up here that we don't have data for. Um, so you tend to get these kind of weird jagged edges at the side. This is only a problem if you're looking at the very edges of your actual data set. If you were just looking at a, you know, a region within this colored area, it would not be a problem because you have all of the data for the entire screen that you're looking at. If you had a global data set, this would not, not be a problem at all. So in general, it, it's, it's not a serious issue. We also quantify the fidelity um, for client-side rastering, where we're making comparisons against the ideal raster generated by the server-side rendering, which is again, as good as you can get. Um, exponential decay, as you can see, is this blue line here. It reaches its maximum fidelity in less than half a second, just about. Um, and as far as the user is concerned at that point, we've, you know, we've rendered however many gigabytes of data in half a second. Uh, even with no decay, it doesn't achieve perfect fidelity. You can see with no decay, um, it's kind of hard to tell, but it doesn't get quite to zero. Uh, and the reason for this is that data points are not evenly spaced, um, partly because just because of the curvature of the earth and partly because of the way the uh, predictions are made, uh, but the client treats them as though it is because they don't have information about the bounds of each data point. They just have the latitude and longitude of the data point. Um, so it's not perfect, but it's 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 almost indistinguishable from perfect. It's it's pretty close. So the conclusions go over this is that Aperture is capable of visualizing a dense continent scale spatial uh, geospatial data set at sub second latencies from multiple simultaneous users. Um, you can convert arbitrary user queries into queries over sketch data sets. Uh, we looked at both rastering with the server and the client, and they both take a roughly equivalent amount of time. Um, the server-side rastering limits the number of simultaneous clients, while client-side rastering results in a minor loss in fidelity around the edges of the data set. Aperture makes use of resources available in both the client and the server. Uh, simultaneous subqueries make effective use of parallel disk accesses, so you're using all the resources available on your uh, server efficiently. Multiple proxy nodes take advantage of all the network bandwidth available to your server to make things as fast as possible. And we can make use of client CPUs and GPUs to redu reduce both server loads and uh, latency at the client side, assuming, of course, that the client has a reasonable machine. If they do not, you might want to stick with server side rendering. Um, thank you. I, th I think that's the end of my talk. I know we have some, some system for questions. Um, I'll have to see how that works. You would hear, okay, Kevin, Ray. thank you very much. That was a fire hose of, of information. Um, I hope that's a good thing. <laughs> yes. Um, so yes, for questions, um, people who are the viewers, you should have a place to put questions at the bottom uh, if you want. Um, uh, I added a couple myself. I will, I will read to the speaker any questions that do come in. And, uh, and we'll see how it goes from there. So um, uh, I admit I, I didn't quite grasp, Kevin, the, uh, 
this concept of sketches and strands. You had this, this diagram with the kind of lines running through your thing. I think it was around your slide number eight. Yeah. Can you kind of elaborate on, on that? I'm, I'm used to admittedly visualizations of either, you know, it's some spatial data. So you have a raster image, that's it. You're not necessarily worried about performance or you have some time series data, you wanna see a graph, that kind of thing. But these sketches and strands, that seemed like, um, like a pretty important thing. Can you, can you say a bit yeah. more? So it's, it's data compression is what it is. It's, it's not, I mean, fundamentally, it's not really that different from just, you know, putting your data in a zip file to make it smaller. Um, the, the main advantage of the way that we've organized these strands, and we have this forest based on um, spatial and temporal regions, is that you can query it that way. Um, and you can reconstruct individual pieces of the data. Um, it's, it's mostly just conceptual. Uh, in, in practice, what happens is that we take all of the data for a certain region, and we just take the average and the, the variance and the covariance and everything you need to, um, I, I'm trying to, Welford statistics is what we used, everything you need to recompute um, the original data. And you're just storing that in a way that makes it easy to access. And then you can use these statistics to estimate what the original data was. Um, and the main advantage of this is that you can compress as much as you want. Um, you know, you could take 10,000 points and compute the, the mean and the covariance and try and figure it out, um, figure out what the original data might have looked like. So do you have sort of a sketch or a strand for each um, uh, area in your geohashing uh, breakup is that is that what you're saying? So you've got like a sort of low res course for the single letter uh, regions, and then you know you you compute these sketches for each of the regions in your geohash uh, slicing and dicing. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. So the the first thing you would do is define how long you want your geohashes to be. Um, we were using five characters. It gets very small after that. Um, and then you would compute the variance for each of the features that you wanted within that region. And you would use those variances to figure out how to lay out your strand. Um, for example, do you want humidity to be the first feature? Um, and all, all, that has, all that does is uh, make it a little bit easier to compress things and re reduce the error bound a little bit if you have things with very low variance together. Um, and then you, you just keep statistical information and you discard the original data. Um, and it, it reduces the data set size by a lot. Um, okay, um, thank you. Sure. Uh, let's see, Teja, I'm gonna ask you to move up the John's question here. Um, okay, so John asks, sorry if I missed this, are you making use of a third party remote visualization technology to support server-side rendering such as virtual GL or did you roll your own? No, we ended up making our own. Yeah, I didn't go into too much detail about that. I don't, I don't know if you missed it. Um, we're just, we're computing polygons and then just drawing the polygons onto a, a Java canvas object or whatever. Um, it will use um, GPUs on the server side if they're available. Um, but no, we didn't use any tools for this. It, they didn't seem necessary. We could have looked at, at in, including some of those and see if it was faster. Um, but any sort of any sort of third party tool would have to be able to interpret these strands, which could be a problem. Um, okay. No, we we rolled our own. Right. That's the the classic way to do it, the tried and true method. <laughs> um, okay. So another question. So you, you mentioned this use of geohash. Um, I know this is something I've been thinking about, like what's the right way to do it. My understanding is there seem to be several alternatives for dividing up the globe into these indexable uh, strings, basically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, why geohash? Is geohash better than other alternatives? Uh, I know the, for example, the discrete global grid system is something that the Open Geospatial Consortium is trying to standardize. I think the there's a there's a military one. Um, you know, yeah, there's better, faster, more there's, established. There's loads. Um, I mean, actually, you ask, we've, um, we're adding some more features to this, or I'm not on this project anymore, but 
while I was still working on it, we were adding more and we were just using latitude and longitude bounding boxes because we were using some databases that worked with those. I don't, you know, I, I've, I haven't worked with the discrete global grid system or anything like that. Um, mostly we use geohashes because my advisor really liked them for some reason. Uh, I think that the nice property about them is, is that they are hierarchical. You know, every, um, you get more refined, you can incrementally refine or, or coarsen, I guess, the, the region you're working at very cheaply, All right? You don't need to know about your neighbors. It all, you can compute all of the geohashes next to you dynamically. You can compute all of the geohashes inside of you or above you just, you know, with a snap of the fingers. And it does simplify searches when you have everything um, structured like that. Downsides are that it's not very precise. Um, and I'm guessing a lot of these other systems will have more dynamic ways of defining a region, which would make some things a lot easier. Yeah, honestly, I don't know if they're better or not. I think it's just, you have to make a few choices up front about how you how you divvy things up and, and how yeah. you I think the geo the geo hash choice was made before we started on visualization, and so we were sort of stuck with it. Okay, but it's not something you invented. It's supported by software tools and so forth. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 very simple. There are tools for pretty much every language, and it's not a lot of code to get it working. Okay. Okay. Um, I know we have uh, a bunch of people on. Are there other uh, questions that anybody want to ask for uh, for Kevin? Okay, we're going once, going twice here. Okay, not seeing more questions. Um, so Kevin, I'd like to thank you once again for giving us this uh, seminar. Definitely a lot to think about. I believe that we have number one recorded and so it will be made available. I don't, I don't know if we have a copy of your slides that we can distribute. Um, I think you do. That'd be good. I guess maybe I'll just add one more question. Is, is the software you've done, is this sort of an open source thing now or is it, uh, you it know? Is, it is all open source. It's under, um, the, all of this project got moved to something called Sustain. If you look for Sustain Colorado State University online, you should be able to find it. Okay. I can't guarantee whether it's it's working right now. I haven't, <laughs> you know, I haven't, I haven't been on it for a couple of months, but it was last I saw. Well, Kevin, thanks again for your talk. Uh, yeah. Good luck with your PhD work. Uh, we hope to see you back in Boulder, uh, back at NCAR one of these days. So. Well, thanks. Thanks very much for inviting me. Yeah. And thanks everybody for, for joining us. Uh, see you again, hopefully next month for the next seminar. Bye-bye.